Uh, oh, it just has a button, but it's not actually starting recording. Uh -huh. Oh, there it is. We're live. Ah, okay. And there we go. Welcome to uh, the Vancouver Technical Users Group Security Sessions with Robert Slade. Tonight we uh, discuss NFTs. Nifty things? <laughs> what do you think, Rob? Okay, well, might as well get started with it. Uh, even though it's just me and you, uh, if you can, uh, uh, we'll have to work out how uh, how you can get it to me. But um, anyways, yes, NFTs, Bitcoins and blockchains and digital cash. Oh, my. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll put it up and other people will be able to to see this later on. Anyways, um, it, and speaking of later on, um, next meeting in a couple of weeks, June 15th, security implications of quantum computing. And the the link there and the explanation of what this is all about and, and the uh, YouTube channel where uh, all the videos are. And oh, by the way, yes, I have to get back here and uh pump in all the oh no that's uh that's wrong okay i need to go back and get all the urls for tonight because we've got uh all kind there we go yes uh we've got uh a bunch of stuff uh Oh, somebody else has joined us here. Supposedly they haven't identified themselves as yet. But anyway, um, so, yeah, security. You, you twice and me. Ah, OK, you got two and I got Three two, right. Yeah. OK, well, anyway, security implications of quantum computing on June 15th and, and we'll do that. Um, and also coming up, uh, B-Sides San Antonio, SATX, on, is happening on June 12th. And uh, they have either asked me or allowed me to do a uh, security and CISSP lessons from COVID-19, which is the full security lessons presentations, which we had here in, in three parts, nice. combined okay. with a, a bunch of uh, extra stuff for a one day CISSP seminar. So uh, anybody who wants to uh, learn fairly quickly what they need to know for uh, the CISSP certification and what the exam's all about, uh, that's uh, June the 12th and B-Sides San Antonio is free. So uh, you can sign up and, and there you go. And uh, anyways, that's that's also upcoming in about a week and a half. So something that I came across, this was uh, uh, an evolutionary guy uh, was talking about this and, and made the uh, comment that communication is the process by which a transmitter sends a signal designed to manipulate a receiver's actions in order to improve the transmitter's inclusive fitness. So I am transmitting something trying to manipulate you so that uh, this will improve my inclusive fitness. I don't know quite how that works with the uh, seminar series as, as we're doing here, but what the heck. Um, uh, I thought it was cute anyways. So, ah, and since we are talking about money today, um, I, a couple of things that I noticed uh, uh, recently, Microsoft Canada, um published uh, or somebody from microsoft canada so james you should you know contact them and again tell them about this stuff uh they uh, wrote an article saying that there were three and a half million people short in security that we got this talent gap in in security and we needed you know three and a half million more people i, I assume that's worldwide but uh, in any case um Going back to a couple of slides ago, you know, if you got anybody that you want to get into security, 
send them to B-side San Antonio and we'll put them through the, the one day CISSP uh, seminar. Uh, and uh, CNN got into this as well. Their headline for this was wanted millions of cybersecurity pros, salary, whatever you want. And if only it were so. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I, I this is yet another uh, of the articles that I have been seeing for 40 years in, in this business where the, the business people are always saying, oh, there's a shortage of talent. And we're all saying, hey, look, you know, we're here and we're not getting the big bucks. So, you know, uh, when we get well, we talk about value, right? You know, uh, there's there's not enough security people, then we should be getting the big bucks because scarcity is a part of, of what value is. But anyways, there's various aspects to value. Uh, when we value something. Um, there's the utility and productivity. And, and again, recently uh, I saw something uh, indicating that the difference between uh, undemocratic or static productivity and uh, democratic or dynamic productivity. And the, the example that was being used was uh, land, um, you know, agricultural purposes. Uh, primarily the, the production is, is on land. And, you know, as, as Mark Twain said, buy land, they're not making anymore. Uh, whereas <laughs> cows, yeah, they're, they're making more cows all the time, you know. So um, the, the difference between a, a resource that is, is fixed and immutable and um, uh, your possession of it is, is an absolute lock on, on productivity and a uh, you know, different type of resource where um, you can uh, increase the, the uh, productivity capacity. Um, and uh, again, I noticed uh, something recently, uh, somebody was talking about one of the wars that's going on in the world and, and describing the two parties. And I could see immediately, okay, on the one hand, you've got an agricultural society, and on the other hand, you've got a pastoralist uh, society and they are not going to get along they you know they look at productivity differently they you know have different societal values right from the get-go in terms of the the type of productivity and and uh what they do to generate value and wealth um so uh all kinds of things but yeah um the productivity the scarcity and and as i say you know if uh there are so few people um in security then why i'm I, as, as a security maven, not, you know, really rich if there's too few of us. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and then there's um, issues of, of convertibility. Um, do you have something that people will agree has value and so people will be willing to uh, give you various goods and services for what you have? So, you know, is it going to be convertible? And so all of these are issues that um, come into all of the things we're going to talk about. Um, sorry, NFTs are going to be way down the line because we've got a whole bunch of things we've got to put in place before we discuss NFTs. Yep. Well, yeah. So it's all part of it, right? Uh, all part of it. This is all part of it. So um, then we get into currency and issue, you know, what is currency? What is cash? What is money? Um, and you know, primarily, this is this is all on the basis of trust. Um, it really doesn't matter what kind of you know technology you put behind it. Basically, do you trust that um, this piece of paper or coin or whatever it is, um, when you give it to somebody, you will get you know bread or flour or you know grain or or seed or what you know whatever it is that. Um, you are needing uh, and you know the currency the the cash the money is a uh, an easier way to to carry it around and of course the financial people will talk about financial instruments and and currency is simply one type of financial industry uh, instrument and and we need to trust that that financial instrument is is solid that it has some kind of that back into it um so you know in, it used to be in 
currencies around the world, that it would be the gold standard, that a country would have a certain amount of gold in reserve so that um, if you brought in their currency, they would be able to exchange it and, and give you the equivalent value in, in gold. Uh, gold being one of the values or uh, easily convertible uh, materials um, that could be used for some type of financial portability. Uh, anyway, you know, so this is this is the beginnings of, of what we have to establish before we get into what's a, a cryptocurrency and and bitcoins and blockchains and and everything else. A uh, bit of a uh, well, I, I don't know that it's really a side issue here. Um, one of the aspects that we have to deal with in terms of currency as currency gets used more widely is authentication. And of course, there's always the issue of counterfeiting of currency and, and uh, somebody creating fake financial instruments, which then have to be uh, valued, uh, converted by uh, what was supposedly the, the original issuer, but in, in this case, of course, is, is not. Uh, but um, uh, interestingly, uh, as an example of multi-factor authentication, the Knights Templar, um, they had a lot of money, and um, because of that, and, and because of the fact that they had uh, houses, uh, it's not really houses, I mean, you know, facilities, in many different locations, uh, they not only created an early bank, but money transfers. And so you would be able to go to a nearby uh, Knights Templar facility, uh, house, chapter house, castle, whatever, and uh, deposit money with them, and, and they would give you a letter. Now, in that letter, that that's one factor. You have, you know, one factor, something you have. That's the letter. But in order to prove that you were you, the letter, which was encrypted, had a question that only you knew the answer to or a password that you knew. And so it now we have two-factor authentication. We have something you have, the letter, and something you know, the answer to the question or the password. And, and the letter itself is encrypted so that while you're carrying it, you can't figure it out or, or alter uh, what it says. And of course, it would say how much money you had deposited. And so when you got uh, to someplace else, some distant uh, chapter house for the Knights Templar, uh, then you would be able to produce that letter and they would be able to authenticate that, yes, you were you, you had validly uh, put in this amount of money, and uh, they would be able to uh, dole that money out to you. Less, of course, a handling fee, which, you know, is also uh, what banks were into. Now, in terms of currency, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's always this uh, foreign exchange speculation that goes on as, um, is this currency overvalued or undervalued and, and uh, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, that gets calculated in all kinds of weird and wonderful ways. But the Economist magazine for many years has had a very simple one, the Big Mac Index. And um, this really uh, assumes that the, the value of a Big Mac, McDonald's Big Mac, is pretty much fixed regardless of where you are in the world. And therefore, uh, what you are charged for the Big Mac is an indication of whether the local currency is overvalued or undervalued. And it was really interesting. Um, some, uh, my uh, recent uh, CISSP seminar, the full uh, one, um, one of the students there was was indicating that um, it was more expensive uh, to get a McDonald's meal here in Canada than it was in his home country, which would tend to indicate that his country's currency is undervalued uh, if it seems to be more expensive here. So that's that's you know a very that makes sense. 
Yeah. Very, very, very good. Yeah. Anyways. The new gold standard. Yeah, the new gold standard. I, unfortunately, Big Macs are not exactly, you can't put them in a vault and, and they don't exactly hold their value, but uh, it is an interesting uh, uh, means of, of doing a quick and dirty calculation of, of currency fluctuations. Anyways, as we start getting into this here, uh, blockchain is not the answer. I really do have to get a t-shirt that, that has this on it, you know, written big big letters blockchain is not the answer because blockchain everybody is saying that blockchain is the answer to everything however before i get too much of a rant we'll go into the actual stuff now in the beginning was digital cash um there has been research into digital cash for a number of years and and people have been uh examining uh digital cash and the uh, the requirements for such a thing, um, what you need when you create a, a currency that can be used, transmitted, um, uh, can be used over the internet, over networks, over communications systems without uh, actually physically passing a physical token like a, a bill or a coin or, or something like that. Now, the, the cash is you know, the, the currencies, the monies that we have, um, everything that we've done so far has all been on the basis of, you know, these bills or coins or, or whatever it is. And, and they have been backed in various ways. I say, uh, say you know, um, the, the trust in the government, the uh, gold standards, possibly, um, all of these issues uh, with regard to this type of currency, um, has all been on the basis of this until recently. Now, um, the banks have started to move away from them and, and they have wire transfers. And uh, for example, I'm, I am being paid by various uh, uh, companies um, for different uh, types of work by wire transfers and the information that I provide them from the bank. And I, I keep on asking the bank, you know, is this really safe? Is this really safe? And they keep on not answering. Because I don't know what, you know, what protections they have. Uh, so what I've, what I've done um, in, in terms of trying to protect myself is uh, I have created an account that has no money in it. And when somebody says that they want to send me, you know, wire transfer uh, payments, um, that's the account that I give them. And as soon as it comes into my account, I transfer that out to one of my other accounts so that that account just sits there empty all the time and, and can't be uh, charged in any way. Nobody can uh, can use it um, to uh, to try and get at my finances um, because I just don't know the the uh the wire transfers um the information that's provided um just you know doesn't seem to have an awful lot of protection with it and and then there's um email uh payments and transfers and those uh types of things seem to have even less protection so i'm uh you know i i'm but all of this is to say that um the stuff that we're doing with with finances online and and transferring money uh supposedly either over the internet or, or whatever isn't really designed with that type of communication in mind it's still just a promise that somewhere there's this bundle of bills in a bank vault and and we're just simply uh, sending indications that this bundle of bills no longer belongs to the person who's got the account in that bank, but it's somebody else. Digital cash is an attempt to use this um, without uh, having to have that bundle of bills in, in the bank. So what do we need to do? Well, we have a number of problems. There is the issue of anonymity. Cash is anonymous. 
um, you know, it doesn't have my name on it. When I give you a coin or a dollar bill or something, well, I know there's no dollar bill, a five dollar bill. OK, um, that isn't tied to me in any way, so it's anonymous. And that value can be authenticated without revealing my identity. So we can use that for anonymous payments. We can't do that with with checks or credit cards or wire transfers or, or anything like that. So so digital cash would be some way of transferring value. And authenticating that transfer without revealing the identities of the people involved in in the transfer. There's also the problem of respending. Uh, a number is a number. Data is data. You know, we we have von Neumann computers. There is no difference between uh, programs and, and data. It's all you know, it's all data and programs are just data that you execute in the same way. Uh, you know, any kind of of uh, number, serial number, whatever, you know, it's just a number and it can be copied. And in fact, when I transfer it to you, when I send it to you, I am in fact sending you a copy of what I have, the number that I have. And if I don't destroy it, I could respend that. And and again, that would be a, a form of counterfeiting. Uh, so we've you know we've got to deal with that. Then there's uh, issues of portioning, Did, uh, cash. Um, I mean, we have different denominations in in the cash, and and you know, generally speaking, the higher denominations are bills. The lower denominations are, are the coins, um, but you know if if I uh, give you a five dollar bill and what I have purchased is not uh, you know is is worth less than five dollars, you can give me change, um, so that you know the the value is maintained there. Um, so we need some uh, way of of portioning. That's probably an an easier problem, but it is still a problem that has to be dealt with in terms of, of digital cash, true digital cash. Now, we don't have, don't yet have true digital cash because um, we have been exploring various cryptographic approaches, um, including some interesting ones where respending increases the ability to identify this, the sender. So in a sense, um, if you engage in, in counterfeiting by respending, um, that reduces your anonymity. So, uh, you know, interesting stuff that, that can be done there. Uh, but not yet. So, a few years ago, we got into cryptocurrency. Numbers with special properties, uh, by and large. And... Um, there were a limited number, so we were creating artificial scarcity in order to increase or maintain the value. Um, but because these are numbers with special properties, anybody can, if they know the formula for do it, do that calculation, do Bitcoin mining. And of course, uh, this is going on all the time now. And for Bitcoin itself, Bitcoin being only one of the cryptocurrencies, of course. Bitcoin mining uses more energy than Argentina. Um, and we can calculate that fairly accurately because approximately one coin is being created every 10 minutes. So we know how much processing has to go on in order to create one coin. So um, that is a that is a number uh, that we can uh, be fairly certain of, but that's an interesting number because you know that means here is just you know people trying to create wealth, and they are the the relatively few of them that there are in the world. They are using more energy than the whole country of Argentina. So you know this is this is contributing to global warming, um, and it gets worse. Now. Um, in cryptocurrencies, um, we have transactions. The transactions, um, generally speaking, in, in all the um, uh, extent cryptocurrencies, there, there is portionality, uh, or the, there is at least some uh, 
uh, possibility of portionality there. There's digital signing um, so that uh, there's, uh, you know, non repudiation and that can be recorded in a blockchain. And what's a blockchain? Of course, a blockchain is just a distributed database. Um, and we'll, we will come back to that. Uh, interesting comment I saw recently uh, on a, a television show. And of course, you know, great source of information there. Survivalists are stocking up on crypto coins. And, and it's sort of like, what? You know, uh, survivalists are going off the grid. By definition, crypto coins would mean nothing to them because they're just numbers. They, I mean, they, they don't even have any physical uh, presence. I know that somebody did actually create bitcoins, like coins that are worth one bitcoin. But um, uh, no, um, they're, they're not going to be starting up on crypto coins. Um, not only is, is the coinage itself just numbers, but the trust factor behind it is based on this blockchain, which is a distributed database. So that means you need a whole bunch of computers and, and networks in order to maintain the value here. Um, yeah, no, this is not not going to work. No, no survivalists are going to be stopping up on crypto coins unless they're really, really dumb survivalists. So different cryptocurrencies. We've got Bitcoin and then Bitcoin itself is, is spinning off. Um, something called Bitcoin Cash, uh, trying to have a, a more useful uh, system than the Bitcoin in, in terms of transferring uh, value here. And uh, anyways, all kinds of things. Dogecoin, of, which started out as a parody um, and, and now actually has a, a fair amount of value to it. Ethereum. Um, Interesting. Uh, Ethereum is is really big in the NFT world as as we get into that. And there, uh, they say the estimated power requirement for Ethereum. I, this is not mining. This is for the operation of Ethereum. The estimated power requirement is the size of Ireland. So we're not even doing any any production of wealth here. This is just the. Uh, power that is being consumed simply by using this currency for whatever it is that you're doing with it. And in fact, we don't know that because the actual requir power requirement is unknown and unknowable because of the variation in the blockchain and the variability in how it's implemented and the issues in regard to the blockchain about how uh, uh, how it works, um, how uh, what the requirements are and uh, how seriously uh, people adhere to those requirements. Um, and that goes on uh, in very much remote locations. Anybody who is using Ethereum in any way, or even just interested in Ethereum, could conceivably be part of the blockchain, and therefore there could be power consumption on their computer that we know nothing about, simply because they're interested in Ethereum. So we, we don't know and, and cannot know uh, how much power this uh, cryptocurrency or any cryptocurrency actually is using in, in their uh, stuff. Oh, by the way, in terms of the mining, uh, Bitcoin mining, the UK police uh, found that they, what they what they were seeing was um, obviously a theft of power. And as they started examining this, they they realized there was an awful lot of heat dissipation from this location, a lot of ventilation ducts. What they thought they were finding was a, a grow up. And instead, it was a, a Bitcoin mining operation. Uh, so interesting there, the uh, uh, the theft of power and, and stuff that's going on in, in terms of uh, uh, Bitcoin mining. Uh, Dogecoin, as I say, started out as um, 
as a parody um, and, and now actually seems to be an actual financial instrument. And, and as somebody said, um, Dogecoin is not so much an alternative deflationary numismatic instrument as it is an inflationary leisured exploration of community building around a crypto asset. So that's what Dogecoin is. Uh, other cryptocurrencies. Now, Facebook got in on the act. Uh, they started Libra. Um, I, I'm i not sure what happened here. I, I think eventually people realized if Facebook kept hold of Libra, then anybody who participated in it would basically be under Facebook's thumb. Facebook would have total control. And so there seems to have been a sort of a rebellion which has resulted in uh, Libra changing its name to Diem and uh, changing its operations so that um, Facebook was removed from its its centrality to the system. Uh, but that is um, an alternative cryptocurrency starting as a completely commercial enterprise. Uh, China has a digital one um, with controllable anonymity. I, I really love uh, Chinese uh, phrases there. That um, seems to be when when you have controllable anonymity, you can uh, realize that controllable means you know up to and including zero. So um, uh, China is um, definitely cracking down on cryptocurrencies coin mining and of course any other form of uh, financial or economic activity that is not under Chinese Communist Party control. So um, there are uh, you know obvious uh, motives there for China's getting into some form of, of cryptocurrency and and if you uh, invest in that. Um, you deserve pretty much everything you'd get. Uh, Dcash from the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. Um, uh, they're trying their own cryptocurrency there. Uh, Canada, I believe, is is uh, working toward di a digital loony. I'm I'm not quite sure how that's going to work. But uh, anyways, what can you do with cryptocurrencies? You can buy a Tesla. Oh, wait, no, you can't. For a brief time, you could, but uh, uh, Tesla is, is no longer uh, accepting Bitcoin to buy uh, Teslas. Um, there is at least one pizza place um, that will uh, sell you a, a pizza for Bitcoin. Um, it seems to me um, uh, not only a silly thing to do, but um, in fact, incredibly wasteful because uh, the uh, you know it's a low value item and and Bitcoin uh, specifically um, is of course a high value coin um, and a, a huge blockchain. And every time you buy a pizza, just the fact that you bought a pizza gets replicated and processed over thousands or even millions of computers. And again, the energy dissipation, even though that's not a terribly heavy processing load on each one of those transactions, when you multiply it by a million, you know, your $10 pizza purchase um, may be costing hundreds of dollars in, in power just because of the, you know, that tiny minuscule amount of power that's consumed, but multiplied by a huge number of computers. And, and again, that's one of the reasons that we do not know uh, absolutely what the carbon footprint, if you will, of any of the cryptocurrencies are. Uh, there was one house in uh, the town of Kelowna. Uh, that you could have bought for 12.25 Bitcoin. I, I don't know if that sale has gone through. Uh, it was really interesting. The uh, real estate agent on the news who was talking about it uh, said the first thing they had to do was find out if it was legal, and apparently it was, and that sort of thing. Uh, but of course, uh, one thing you can definitely do with cryptocurrencies is speculate. 
And that seems to be mostly what people are doing with cryptocurrencies is speculating because the the prices, uh, the, the values of, of Bitcoin and, and value uh, sort of has to be put into quotes here, um, is fluctuating wildly. And it's still an incredibly speculative thing. This is not a financial instrument. Do not put your savings into Bitcoin or any other uh, cryptocurrency. Um, you just don't know what is going to happen with it. Um, on May 20th, cryptocurrencies collectively lost $1 trillion. And that was in one day. And uh, as one economist said, you've got to believe that the loss of a trillion dollars in value has to have some impact in the global economy, in national economies, um, in financial activity. Uh, you know, you, you just can't pull that amount of money out of the, the total wealth and, and have it evaporate and not have some impact somewhere. Um, that was on, on May the 20th, um, roughly 40% of the total value of all cryptocurrencies there. So, you know, this is, this is where the speculation is at the moment. We just do not know what's happening and, and what it's going to uh, affect. Now, Blockchain, of course, is, is a record of digitally signed transactions and the, the digital uh, signatures created uh, hopefully prevent non-repudiation. It is distributed through a proportion of all participants in the system. Not all computers, of course, involved in whatever the cryptocurrency is, will necessarily uh, participate in the blockchain or in all transactions but there is a proportion of them. And again, um, this is implemented differently in different cryptocurrencies. They have different levels of digital signing. They have different levels of certification of the digital signing. They have different um, uh, parameters for the proportion of distribution. Um, you know, all of this is, is different in different cryptocurrencies. So it's very hard to say for blockchain as a whole is it safe or not because it's not a single thing it is simply a collection of ideas um the transactions will require processing just in terms of the transaction itself then there is going to be processing for checking against the blockchain database does this person who claims to be paying with this bitcoin actually own this bitcoin or has it been transferred to somebody else at some uh, time in the past. And of course, there's a lot of processing for the digital signatures of all of this. So again, there's, you know, there's a fair amount of uh, calculation that goes on. So, James, are you still there? And nobody else has joined us. Well, apparently, we don't need a break or I'm going to take a drink. And that has an intrinsic value. Um, and then I guess we're just uh, going to continue on then. But as I say again, blockchain is not the answer. So cryptocurrencies, anonymity. Um, the identity may be encrypted. But even if it's encrypted, it may be recoverable. Oh, by the way. Seeing as how we took a break, yeah, we can we can do that way. Um, and it all of this depends upon the implementation of the blockchain. What are the parameters? Uh, what what level of uh, digital signing do we do? What type of encryption are we using for this? What are the parameters for the distribution? Um, in terms of anonymity, even if it is supposed to protect anonymity. Uh, Bitcoin, um, well, uh, people have found out to their sorrow that Bitcoin is not as anonymous as people think. 
because everything tends to be tied to a wallet. If the wallet that can then be tied to somebody when they go in and cash out, um, then you know basically that blows your anonymity. But in addition to that, because of the parameters used by Bitcoin, if you control 51% of the blockchain, now that's that's going to be very difficult with, with Bitcoin because of the, the huge number of people involved in it. But if you can get that 51%, then you control the whole blockchain. And at that point, um, you, can, uh, you can reveal identities. You can uh, uh, basically manage everything. Um, you can uh, create transactions and, and transfer um, whatever, you know, value uh, Bitcoin has uh, to basically whomever you want. You, you know, if, if you own that much of the blockchain, you, you manage the whole thing. And this is majority rules. Now, again, that, that varies by implementation, so it's going to be different for different cryptocurrencies and different implementations of blockchain, but there probably is going to be a certain proportion where ownership of that much of the blockchain means you manage the whole thing. And, and again, um, when uh, uh, Facebook had Libra and uh, DM, um, you know, if, if uh, Facebook centralized control of, of the blockchain, which originally they were going to do, then basically they could manage the whole thing. Uh, and same thing for China. I'm, I'm sure that China is going to have, uh, you know, fully centralized uh, control of their their blockchain. And so basically they can do whatever they like there, um, you know, and, and uh, in terms of controllable anonymity, that's all, you know, they're the ones who control it. You have no control whatsoever. Um, ah, an interesting thing that I came across this this fellow. Um, uh, I I have slight sympathy for his position, although not for his facts. Um, but he was uh, saying recently. Cryptocurrency is the single enabling factor in the ransomware plague. It could not exist without cryptocurrency and is a net negative on civilization. Regulatory impotence is enabling a terrible and growing human cost associated with crypto crime, and it needs to stop. Um, unfortunately, as Vessel and Boncha pointed out to him, cryptocurrency was not invented until 2009. Ransomware was invented in 1988. So ransomware was around for over 20 years before cryptocurrency even existed. Now, cryptocurrency may be used fairly widely in, in ransomware and breach extortion activities, but, uh, you know, cryptocurrency did not breed ransomware. That's just, you know, no, it didn't. Full stop. Okay. Okay. Um, more on the blockchain. Uh, just, it's a distributed database. Um, there is digital signatures and certification. Is there encryption? Maybe, maybe not. Is there confidentiality? Maybe, maybe not. As the implementation varies. And, and so we really can't say anything uh, terribly specific about blockchain per se, because blockchain is not a single thing. Some other interesting suggestions for applications. Um, New York's Excelsior vaccine passport is supposedly based on a, a blockchain. Now, why? Why would you want a blockchain? I mean, you know, you've got a central database of who's been vaccinated. Why do you need a blockchain? This, this does not make any sense. And, and then somebody suggested that we use it for voting. My gosh, I mean, uh, if there's anything that you shouldn't be using blockchain for, it would be voting. As, as somebody who ex examined 
uh, online voting, um, voting machine, even tabulating machines, uh, counting devices, you know, you know, all of this stuff, and even, you know, uh, paper ballots. I mean, I, I have been a, a poll clerk and a deputy returning officer. I, you know, I know this right down to the, the paper level. Um, no, blockchain is definitely not the answer to voting or elections of any kind. I could just see the horrors of of the the recent uh, election in the United States. If you know the blockchain had been added to the mix, it was you know hard enough when it was actual paper ballots. <sighs> and then there's smart contracts. Now smart contracts sound like an interesting co concept. Basically, you create uh, a contract where the 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 digital contract automatically as conditions are fulfilled fulfills part of the contract um and you know that sounds like a good thing until you realize this isn't anything new um what they're talking about with regard to smart contracts is is dApps or decentralized apps now if you're old enough um you remember the back in the in the 90s when everything was going to be in the browser we were going to uh give up the platform wars you know we weren't going to have to worry about whether anybody had a mac or a pc or you know windows or linux or anything everything was going to happen in the browser and we would do it with um building blocks of software called applets which are basically these guys decentralized apps. Um, and and so, you know, this has been done before and it spawned off things like Java and JavaScript and Java and JavaScript are not the same thing and authentic code. And I could, you know, tell you all kinds of reasons why that was hugely problematic and didn't work and, and so on and so forth. But anyways, there's a, a little reference there. If you want to go and look up smart contracts and um, you know, they're all for it, but you, you know, if, if you read that paper with um, a little bit of a critical eye, you can see that they're really not talking about anything terribly interesting uh, in doing that. It, it would definitely require um, a very different type of, of contract negotiation and the, the contracts to be created under a smart contract system let alone the implementation of a blockchain involved with any of it um would uh you know leave you with hugely hugely complicated uh contracts and and i'm i'm really not sure uh how that would benefit anybody um i suppose that there are certain situations where you would want something that that automatic but uh, uh, certainly for for most of human activity, it would be something else. Um, uh, another uh, related technology here um, from the people who are trying to bring you the Internet computer. And again, um, they seem to be trying to go back to the uh, thin computing applet, um, everything in the browser type situation. And they talk about chain key technology. Um, this is very much involved with an actual uh, cryptocurrency called Coinbase, um, which, uh, sorry, and, and in addition to that, uh, the internet computer um, people talk about something called the ICP token, which seems to be sort of their uh, value item uh, for, for their technology. Um, again, another URL if you want to look up uh, their uh their take on things so finally having gotten all of those basics into place all the the bricks in the wall here we can now talk about nfts or non-fungible tokens otherwise known as crypto art which i think is a terrible and very misleading name or term for what is happening here uh nfts are not art um, no, 
you yeah you you do not well, well we'll get to what it isn't and and what you don't have when you have it when you own an F nft but fungible is portionality and convertibility so uh think that right back to our our value slide right at the beginning we're talking about land and cattle land is portionable you can divide it up uh and you know one acre out of you know 2000 square miles um is roughly equivalent to another acre bearing in mind things like streams and watering and and uh, rocks and and slopes and that sort of thing but basically you know it is you you can portion it up you know you you don't have to uh sell the whole farm you can you know pay off uh, with a little bit of land some of the value um and convertibility um and again land by and large uh people will have a, a fairly good understanding of what the value of a piece of property is uh a cow is not portionable beef is portionable but a cow is not when you go to a cattle auction you don't get to buy half a cow uh you know <laughs> you you know it, it hasn't been butchered yet you you buy the whole cow or you don't um so you don't have the portionality and and again the convertibility that's why they have the auctions because the value fluctuates and that sort of thing so non-fungible tokens here are basically certificates about a piece of art by and large where uh somebody um well you know they they buy something and it's related to this piece of art um and and again once again you know a piece of art you can't you know carve it in half and still retain uh the value unless of course it's a banksy piece um so uh you know and and the convertibility the value of of a you know piece of banksy art um is you know one million dollars and then you destroy it and then it's two million dollars you know that that doesn't make any sense in terms of uh financial negotiations for anything else so non-fungible tokens really just says you know we're speculating big time on stuff that other people aren't really going to be trading in so um you get a whole bunch of problems right off the start how do you know that this token is set or signed by the author or the creator of the work you know um there's there's issues of of copyright of intellectual property here it is you know uh an art gallery open owner creating the nft um and and doesn't actually have you know ownership of this piece of art is is just able because he's temporarily holding it as a steward of it uh selling nfts of this piece of art that he doesn't actually own and and nor do you if you buy the nft you may not own the copyright or the art um and and again we've got all the issues of authentication and public key infrastructure all over again with non-fungible tokens so you know it's it's really uh speculative and weird and all kinds of legal questions that have not been answered or even asked in many cases uh now different nft platforms these are our companies that are dealing with non-fungible tokens uh open super rare nifty gateway um different companies there um autograph which is um being promoted by and i believe uh that tom brady actually owns uh or at least has an interest in the company uh which means that a number of people are uh wondering if when you buy something from autograph it's under inflated pricing but um then uh one that it, i mean autograph is not specifically in the sports world but nba top shot is but 
um, NBA Top Shot uh, as a company seems to be problematic because um, there have been problems with people withdrawing their money uh, after the sales. They're not able to get their money out after they have sold something and, and all kinds of issues with, of course, any of these things with regard to the possibility of money laundering. Um, there just doesn't seem to be uh, anything in, in regard to these things that uh, would uh, actually uh, provide insight as, as to the trust that is necessary that we talked about right at the beginning in, in terms of uh, value and currency. <coughs> Now, for all of these platforms, will they still be around in a few years? Because, again, you aren't actually buying the artwork. You are buying a link to an entry in a database on that platform. You know, how uh, if, if the, the platform itself disappears, uh, then what happens to the value of your NFT? So again, speculative stuff. Um, now, interestingly, a company called Rally, they, they do not specifically sell NFTs. Um, this is a, a, a trading app for classic cars, baseball cards, other types of memorabilia. Um, but they uh, possibly just simply in a publicity stunt are selling shares of one copy of the Declaration of Independence. So you can actually buy a share. I don't know what proportion you supposedly own of this this one particular copy, but of course nobody who buys a share is actually going to get uh, to see this thing or hold it or keep it or anything like that. Um, you can only just trade your your value. Um, uh, and and just in terms of shares of of business of whatever kinds of, of business. Um, Fortune magazine um, uh, published an article, and of course, Fortune magazine is behind a, a paywall, so I did not uh, see everything involved here. But basically, they are saying that a blockchain and NFTs are going to allow for shares in complicated real estate transactions. Well, I mean, you know, the, these transactions are complicated enough, anyways. You know, how is is blockchain going to be the answer to this? How is how is this going to make it any simpler? We've had shares in all kinds of things for decades. So, you know, why why do we need blockchain in, involved in this? Um, doesn't really seem there. Anyways, to get back to the platforms, the, the platforms themselves, if they are to be any good, and, and we don't know uh, a lot of the answers to a lot of these questions here. What do they do about authentication and verification of the artist, of the ownership of the artwork, of the ability to sell an NFT based on the artwork? Um, what about appeals processes for artists saying that uh, they did not agree to the creation of an NFT or uh, did not get paid for you know the, the proportion um, of the value of, from an NFT or or anything. Like that. <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me. No. I, I okay. Just off. Should have okay. my mic muted. But yes, NFT platforms are are going to be an interesting topic for the next year or two. Absolutely, absolutely, and and of course, copyright and intellectual property enforcement in in all of these things. Um, so, uh, you know, the, again, the, the protection behind intellectual property and, and ownership enforcement. Um, what about uh, hacks of the accounts? Um, you know, somebody creates an NFT or owns something or owns a portion of something um, and, and that is held at the platform. Um, you know, what happens if their account is hacked? What happens if the blockchain itself is hacked, as we discussed earlier? Um, and there's, you know, a variety of ways that this could happen um, in, in regard to hacking the blockchain itself. Uh, again, depending on, on the parameters involved in that. 
uh, blockchains and global warming. As I said, you know, we've we've talked about Bitcoin mining. We have talked about the processing involved. Um, that is huge and unknowable, really, in in terms of the blockchains for uh, the existing systems. And so now people are saying that they're going to create green NFTs. I don't know how they're going to do that. You know, is that negative energy involved in processing the blockchain? Um, we just, you know, I I think right now, you know, green NFTs are a, a you know unicorn. Um, and uh, it's you know this is a fantasy uh, that somebody got. I haven't really seen anything that um, actually presents anything that that is reasonable in terms of a green NFT. And some of the NFTs that have been created, um, the Charlie bit my finger video. This uh, has been on YouTube since 2007 one of the earliest viral videos and so the owners the, the family uh the parents of, of charlie and his brother um uh they decided to create an nft and uh it actually it sold um to a company from dubai for seven hundred sixty thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars and because of the the value and the NFT and sole ownership and all that kind of stuff, the the family said that they were going to take it down after um, the NFT was sold. But uh, the company that bought it said, "No, that's okay. So wait, it's back up again. So you can still see Charlie bit my finger, but you can't own the NFT related with it." Any. Uh, they they probably want to be able to share it with people and and use it in their marketing. Probably, I mean, <laughs> I I don't know what other value it would have uh, there. But anyways, uh, now, interestingly, Berkeley has uh, is creating NFTs linked to Nobel Prize papers because of course they got a whole bunch of papers in in their archives from you know people who, who went to Berkeley in their doctoral dissertations later won Nobel Prizes. So you can you can now buy NFTs. Of course, you can't buy the Nobel Prize. You can't buy the paper. You don't get ownership of the idea or anything like that. But you can buy an NFT created to link to a Nobel Prize winning paper. And an article in the Atlantic uh, where somebody who's who's got a connection to the art world uh, is bemoaning NFTs weren't supposed to end like this. Um, and uh, an interesting uh, paper there. And, uh, and, and once again, I remind you, blockchain is not the answer. So. There we are. Nice. We a lot a lot of the information. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it was a ton, and 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 a lot of it. That's why. Oh, and and again, yeah. I better. Uh, I suppose I better stop. Well, I suppose it doesn't really matter if I stop sharing this. There's only a few of us here, but uh, here's the all the URLs and everything from uh, all the references. Uh, for that because it just we're so many uh for okay, this we'll, we'll put them out on linkedin and stuff yeah 